Today, we are very, very pleased um, to have with us uh, Dr. Francois Marceau. He is currently working as a postdoctoral fellow in Ronald Kahn's lab in the Droslin Diabetes Center since 2018. His research is mainly focused on identification of unknown metabolites derived from bacteria that are highly regulated by diet, genetic background, and antibiotics. And number two, functionally characterizing viral insulin IGF-1-like peptides or VILPs, and defining their mechanism of action and understanding their potency and uh, to determine if they affect mammalian pathophysiology. Prior to his uh, postdoctoral position, he received his PhD in physiology from the University of Nantes in France, where he uh, was working on intestinal PCSK9 and cholesterol metabolism. So welcome. This is a really interesting um, approach. And as I'm sure you know, uh, the microbiome has been implicated in uh, both the progression uh, to type 1 diabetes and also sort of you know, what happens to it after diagnosis. So your your work is is really a sort of spot on um, in terms of, uh, you know, that kind of reach. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wesley, for the kind introduction. Yeah. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, can you, let's see, are I'm you able to, to share, share your screen? Yeah. Okay. That, that, that should work now. Okay. So normally you should see my screen now. It looks great, yes. You might want to just do full. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So thank you, Dr. Wesley, for the kind introduction and uh, to give me the opportunity to share uh, a part of my work with uh, your audience today. Uh, so this work is focused on, uh, on one viral insulin-like peptide uh, that show a very interesting behavior uh, since it is able to um, antagonize the IGF-1 uh, receptor signal. So just uh, uh, just, uh, so just before uh, a quick uh, introduction regarding uh, uh, virology. So uh, it's well established that uh, viruses are the, the most abundant biological entity in the biosphere. And uh, if we look at the human body, uh, we have basically 10 times more viruses than uh, bacteria or even human cells. So most of the time, uh, interaction between uh, virus and the host is harmless. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, the virus can breach host defenses and lead to a disease. And one of the mechanisms used by uh, the virus to uh, breach host defenses is called uh, viral mimicry. And it consists for the virus to um, and code for homologue of the host immune system to uh, interact with, uh, with it. So one of the mechanisms uh, behind the uh, valimicry is called horizontal gene uh, transfer, and it was well described with uh, the pox viruses. So the pox viruses uh, infect uh, the cells, and uh, since it's not able to go inside the nucleus, uh, the horizontal gene transfer happened by the retrotranscription of the host mRNA and the integration of the cDNA into the viral gene. So in the case of the pox viruses, for example, it will catch the gene encoding for the chemokine receptor. So next, uh, the, uh, recombinant, uh, the recombined uh, viral DNA is encapsulated in a newly formed virus, and all the cells that will be infected by this virus will uh, produce a soluble chemokine receptor that will be able to uh, bind uh, the chemokine and all immune evasion. So the concept of uh, mole molecular mimicry is not really uh, recent. It was described during the 60s. And the link between uh, molecular mimicry and autoimmune disease or host immune uh, evasion was uh, described 20, late, 20 years uh, later, mostly in these two uh, viruses, uh, FS viruses and Fox viruses. And all the uh, peptides that are mimicked by, by these viruses are uh, involved in uh, immune systems. So it could be soluble cytokine receptor or binding proteins, uh, cytokine or chemokine, or a membrane of chemokine receptors. So from this observation, uh, Emra Atavis, a previous fellow from our lab and is now uh, an assistant professor at Boston College in Brookline, uh, he was wondering if some viruses can encode for human or animal. So to check the, this uh, hypothesis, he performed a bioinformatics search and uh, was uh, able to identify identified 
four viruses that exhibit high similarity with the sequence of the human insulin on the top, the human IGF-1 or the human uh, IGF-2. So the four viruses were the Singapore grouper iridovirus, the grouper iridovirus or uh, GIV, the lymphocystis disease virus SA or LCDB SA, and the lymphocystis disease virus like one, LCDB1, that, was, uh, that I will uh, describe in my presentation. So it's very interesting to note that uh, all of these four uh, viruses, uh, despite the fact that there is large of uh, the, a large number of uh, different family of virus, uh, all of these virus belong to the same virus family called Iridoviridae family. So it's a large uh, DNA uh, viruses family, mostly found in seawater and known to infect fish. And you can see here a picture of a fish that was infected by. Uh, one virus from this family, so it, it, they, they developed, after the infection, they, they developed this kind of uh, tumor-like uh, skin lesion here. Yeah, you can see that, uh, that, that here. Is so that very, uh, Francois, is that very common um, in the sort of fish population, or is it sort of a rare? So it's very common, actually, unfortunately, uh, uh, especially in farm fish. Farmed fish? Yeah. Hmm. So that's, that's actually why, what I was, I was uh, actually going to say. Um, it's mostly known to infect fish, but there is several uh, literature showing that uh, humans are in contact with these viruses. So in these two papers, for example, they were able to find the, the sequence of LCDV1 and SGIV in the uh, fecal virome. And in these two other studies, they, were, uh, they find the sequence of LCDV1 in the human blood. So we are probably in contact with this virus when we eat a fish that was infected by, by this virus, probably. So I just wanted to, to do a quick reminder regarding the structure of insulin and IGF-1 because it's really important in, in my project. Uh, so insulin is produced uh, in the beta cells as a, a pre-pro-insulin, so as a single chain uh, structures, and then secreted as a double chain structure where the, the C chain is removed from the A chain and the B chain and secreted uh, along the, the, the mature insulin. In uh, contrary, IGF-1 secret is secreted by the liver as a single chain peptide, where the C chain stay uh, in green, stay attached to the A chain and the B chain. So because we don't know if the uh, viral insulin peptide will be uh, processed as a double chain or as a single chain, we ask our collaborator, uh, the group of Richard Dimachi in Indiana, to produce for us the uh, viral insulin as a single chain peptide, like IGF-1, or as a double chain peptide, more like insulin. And just to uh, finish with the, with the reminders, uh, both insulin and IGF-1 have their own receptor. So uh, while insulin is more potent to bind on the insulin receptor and lead to a uh, metabolic effect, the IGF-1 will uh, mostly bind on the IGF-1 receptor and lead to mitogenic effect. So to, uh, going back to the, uh, the sequence of the four uh, very insulin-like peptides that were identified by uh, Emra Altantis, all of them uh, possess the uh, six cysteine residues, so highlighted in uh, yellow here, that are essential for the 3D folding of the peptide. They also uh, are uh, quite well-conserved binding residue, um, so, for example, for the uh, insulin and the LCDV1, you can see here that uh, this uh, residue involved uh, in the binding of insulin with the site 1 of the insulin receptor is conserved in uh, LCDV1 uh, double chain. And we did the same thing uh, with, between IGF-1 and the single chain LCDV1. And you can see here the percentage of uh, conservation of the binding residue. So suggesting that this variety like peptide will be able to bind on the, on the insulin receptor or the IGF receptor. And finally, they also all possess a potential uh, signal peptide, suggesting that they can be secreted by the cell. So in, the, in our lab, we have a really cool uh, tool to study uh, insulin and IGF and signaling. So we have a murine brown preadipocyte where the endogenous insulin receptor or IGF and receptor was uh, removed and replaced by either the human insulin receptor or the human IGF and receptor. So at the end, we have cells that, that express only one of the receptor. Um, can I just ask um, why did you choose the murine brown preadipocyte as this cell line mm -hmm. versus any other? So it was the cell line that we developed in the lab, uh, I think. 15 years ago, 
uh, and we use this cell line. Um, we we use that uh, a lot in the lab, so it's well characterized in in uh, in the lab. So that's the reason why I, I study that. You will see later. I can I can show you some uh, some backup. I also so most of the study were done on on this cell line, but I also use a more physiologic uh, cell line. Yes. Okay. Great. Express... Yeah, it's, it's the lab's choice of workhorse. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> great. Exactly. So using uh, the cell line, um, MRA showed that uh, all the variants like peptide were able to bind on the IGFN receptor or the insulin receptor with uh, different uh, affinities. So for example, for the IGFN receptor, you can see here the, bind the, the competitive binding of uh, called IGF1, so in black, and in orange here, uh, the uh, LCDD1 single chain. So he did all of his work on the single chain peptide for all of the variants in like that. And for the insulin receptor, you can see that insulin is the most potent to bind on the insulin receptor, while LCDV1 is actually quite low weak. Uh, the, the binding is quite weak for the single chain LCDV1. So, variant insulin peptide can bind on the insulin and the IGFN receptor, but can also activate uh, both receptors. So, you can see here the activation, the, the phosphorylation of the IGFN receptor induced by an increasing concentration of IGF1 in black, uh, of insulin in blue, and you can see LCDV1 in orange uh, here. So it's able to induce the phosphorylation, but it's less potent than uh, insulin or IGF1. And you can see here the phosphorylation of the downstream CNA with uh, the phosphorylation of AKT here, and ERK induced by uh, LCDV1, a single chain. And similarly, was able to show the same thing for the insulin receptor. So, these variants in lepeptide can bind and activate the receptor, but can also uh, regulate the function mediated by this receptor. So here, for example, uh, it measures the uh, proliferation of humine fibroblast induced by either IGF-1 in black, LCDV-1 in orange, or uh, insulin in blue, GIV in red, or SGIV uh, in green. So we can see here that, for example, uh, LCDV-1 single chain seems to be more potent than insulin to induce the phosphorylation of, of these cells. And regarding um, function mediated by insulin, the insulin receptor, uh, he measured the uh, glucose uptake in uh, uh, an adipocyte cell line, and he was able to show that uh, IGF-1 and insulin are more potent to induce uh, glucose uptake, while uh, LCDV1 single chain is the less potent for insulin to be able to induce the, the glucose uptake. So all of these studies were done on the, with the single chain. So my the goal of my work was to uh, see if uh, the single chain and the double chain can act differently on uh, the insulin and the IGF and receptor signal. So uh, I will start with the uh, insulin receptor. So you can here see a competitive binding experiment done on uh, the uh, ectodomain of the insulin receptor. So I, I basically uh, use the ectodomain uh, code on uh, a 96 well plate. And I use a fixed concentration of labeled insulin and an increasing concentration of either insulin single chain LCDV1 or double chain LCDV1. So while uh, insulin is able to compete with itself to bind on the insulin receptor, which was expected, uh, the single chain LCDV1 seems to be more potent than the double chain to bind on the uh, insulin receptor, but with a lower affinity compared to uh, the endogenous insulin. So I look then at the uh, insulin signaling using the, the, the pre adipocyte that only expressed the human insulin receptors. And I was able to show that uh, if we uh, look on the uh, insulin receptor, the phosphorylation uh, induced by uh, insulin is uh, visible here. But when we look at the phosphorylation induced by LCDV1, either single chain or double chain, it's, it's really weak and we, we don't really see uh, anything. So you think that uh, both of these uh, are insulin like peptide are very weak insulin receptor agonist. And when we look at the downstream signaling, we can see that uh, to start to see some phosphorylation of the downstream signaling, you need to use a very high concentration of, of a single chain LCDD1. So for IRS1, same for AKT, and same for ERK. But uh, see if we compare single chain or double chain, the single chain seems to be a little bit more potent than the double chain to induce the phosphorylation of the downstream signaling. So I did the same thing with the uh, IGFN receptor, and this time I was able to show that uh, for the IGFN receptor, the single chain is uh, more potent than the double chain to bind on the IGFN receptor, and the affinity 
of the single chain is uh, less potent than IJ1, but still very high compared to what we see with the intermediate. So I look at the, at the uh, IGFN receptor signaling, and uh, if we look at the uh, IGFN receptor phosphorylation, it's quite uh, weak, uh, the phosphorylation induced by either LCDV1, single chain or double chain, compared to uh, IGF1, but we can see uh, some, uh, some band, especially if we overexpress the, the membrane. And it's even more visible when we look at the downstream signaling, especially AKT and ERK. And for AKT, it was really interesting to see that uh, at low concentration, so from uh, 0, 1 to uh, 10, we uh, see that LCDV1 single chain act as an agonist on, uh, the, on the phosphorylation of AKT, and it seems to uh, decrease with high concentration. We don't really see that with the, with the double chain. So when we saw that, we uh, thought that uh, maybe LCD1 single chain could act as an antagonist on the, on the IGFN receptor. So I perform uh, the same experiment uh, on this cell, but this time I incubate a, a fixed concentration of IGF1, I use 10 nanomolar, and an increasing concentration of uh, single chain or double chain. So you can see the results on, on the right. So when I uh, increase the concentration of the single chain, I uh, block the phosphorylation induced by 10 nanomolar of IGF1. Uh, of IGF1. And it was really specific to the single chain since the, the, the double chain doesn't show uh, the same pattern. And you can see the yeah, the that's very noticeable. That's great. Yeah, and it was really uh, reproducible. I, I every time I do this experiment, I have exactly the same thing, and it always starts at with equimolar concentration of uh, IGF one and LCDV one single chain, which is mm, very repeatable. Do you think that it's a strong uh, antagonist action? Mm -hmm. And it was visible not only for the uh, IGF one receptor, but also for uh, the downstream signaling, especially AKT and uh, and ERK. And still specific to the single chain because with the double chain we don't we don't see any uh, antagonist. Yeah, that's good. So I performed the same experiment on the insulin receptor to see if uh, this antagonist action was restricted to uh, the IGFN receptor. And as you can see here, uh, we don't see any antagonist action of uh, the single chain or double chain on the insulin receptor phosphorylation or on the downstream signal. So the inhibition of uh, phosphorylation was really specific to the IGFN receptor and not visible on the insulin receptor. So when I saw this uh, effect on the, on the cells, uh, on the signaling, I was wondering if I could uh, see any functional consequence of this uh, antagonist. So I measure the cell proliferations on, uh, so I still using uh, the same uh, pre adipocyte that only expressed the IGFN receptor, the human IGFN receptor. So I incubate these cells with either IGF1 LCD1 single chain in red or LCD1 double chain in blue. So as expected, IGF1 induced the proliferation of the cells. The double chain was not able to induce any proliferation. But interestingly, when we use a low concentration of the single chain, so from 0, 1 to 10, we see a stimulation of the cell proliferation. But when we use higher concentration, and especially 1,000 nanomolar, we don't see any more, uh, any, uh, more cell proliferation. So to see if we can block the proliferation induced by IGF-1 by the single chain uh, LCDV-1, I incubate the cells with uh, a fixed concentration of IGF-1. I use also 10 nanomolar, and I increase the concentration of LCDV-1 single chain in red or double chain in blue. And as you can see, when I increase the concentration of uh, the double chain, I don't see any change of proliferation induced by 10 nanomolar of IGF-1. But when I do the same thing with the single chain, I start to see a decrease with 100 nanomolar and it's significant uh, with uh, 1,000 nanomolar. So we saw this uh, decrease of proliferation uh, in vitro on the cells. So I wanted to see if we could in vivo see the same kind of uh, behavior. So we contact uh, John Kopchik and Edward Ollis from uh, Ohio, from the Edison uh, Biotechnology Institute. And uh, they uh, have developed a mice model called BGH for bovine growth hormone mice. And these mice are transgenic, and they overexpress the bovine growth hormones. So basically, these mice are characterized by a, a higher circulating level of IGF-1. That explains why they are bigger compared to a wild type. So we ask them to, uh, so we, we send them uh, uh, two AV8, one carrying uh, a control sequence, and one uh, carrying the sequence of LCDV1. 
they inject this uh, both AAD into uh, two group of mice uh, of the BGH mice, and they measure the body weight uh, weekly. And this, they then uh, suck the mice and uh, send me uh, several tissues. So I first wanted to double, double check that only the mice that received the AAD LCDV1 were expressing LCDV1 uh, in the liver. So it was an AV8, so targeting the, targeting the liver. So only the mice that received the, the AAD were uh, expressing the uh, LCDV1 sequence. And there was no consequence on IGF1 expression in the liver of these mice. And interestingly, when we uh, look at the body weight of these mice, uh, even just two weeks after uh, the injection, we start to see a decrease of body weight gain, and it was still significant six weeks after the injection. So we inject, they inject only once uh, at the beginning of the experiment. And uh, it was very interesting also to see that uh, this decrease of body weight gain was really specific to lean mass and was not affecting the uh, body fat gain. So it's really specific to, it was really decreasing the uh, body lean mass gain, which is mediated by, uh, which is controlled by uh, IGF. Yes. So that's, this is, that's a very interesting, um, you know, result. Yeah. Yeah, I was not expecting, honestly, to see something in vivo. So I was uh, really, really happy and really surprised to see a decrease, uh, something measurable in, in vivo. Right, right. I mean, from the, you know, cell system to the physiology. Yeah, yeah. No, we were, uh, we were very lucky. Yeah. Serendipitous. Yeah. Prepared <laughs> luck. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so we wanted to see if we can uh, look at the, at what happened at the receptor level. So we uh, collaborate with a group in Australia um, so uh, we contact Michael Lawrence and um, uh, Michael, Michael Lawrence group, and they uh, do cryo EM uh, structure experiment. So here you have the cryo EM structure of the IGF1 receptor, the empty IGF1 receptor, so without any uh, agonist. So you have the uh, L1 uh, domain E, the uh, CR domain E, the L2 domain, and then the three fibronectin type three domain, uh, which are here eyed by the uh, other monomer, but you have the uh, a, a graphical uh, here on the uh, graphical representation of the, the two monomer of the receptor, of the IGFN receptor. So when the, the IGFN receptor is uh, empty, the gap between the two legs is about 67 angstroms. So it's far enough to uh, not uh, inducing the autophosphorylation of the tyrosine kinase domain, which should be represented uh, here just after the fibronectin type 3 domain, which are not visible by cryo -E. So what's happening when uh, IGF-1 bind on the receptor? So IGF-1 bind first on the, uh, bet between the L1 and the CR domain. And then this complex L1, IGF-1, and CR move to the top of the receptor to interact with the L2 domain and the fibronectin type 3 domain of the other monomer. And this uh, interaction induces a change of conformation of the receptor and uh, the, the legs of the receptor come uh, together and uh, then the, uh, the gap uh, between uh, both uh, legs is way less, about 39 angstrom. It's close enough to induce the autophosphorylation of the tyrosine kinase domain and the activation of the, of the downstream signal. So it's quite well established that only one IGF-1 can bind on one receptor at the time. It's not the case for the uh, insulin receptor, for example, there is a debate, but ba basically there is between two and four molecules of insulin that can bind on one receptor. There is, uh, for both of them, insulin receptor and IGF-1 receptor, there is four binding sites, four potential binding sites. So we were very surprised to see that when uh, they performed the cryo -EM structure with a uh, single chain, we were very surprised to see that two single chain LTDV1 are able to bind at the same time on the IGF-1 receptors. And the reason why it's uh, two uh, can bind on the, on the same receptor is because the single chain LCDV1 is only able to interact with L1 and CR, but not with L2. So the complex L1, single chain LCDV1 and CR stay like that and doesn't go uh, up to the receptor, doesn't move to the top of the receptor to interact with the L2 domain or the fibronectin type 3 of the other monomer, leaving the other uh, binding site um, open for uh, interaction with another single chain LCDV1. So when there is two single chain LCD1 on uh, the IGF receptor, 
the gap between the two legs is way bigger, so 90 angstrom, even way bigger than what we see uh, when the, the IGF receptor is unoccupied. And uh, because the two legs are too far from each other, it doesn't allow uh, the autophosphorylation of the, of the receptor. So just to, uh, to summarize uh, what we see, so when IGF-1 binds on the IGF-1 receptor, it's induced the uh, autophosphorylation of the transient kinase domain of the receptor, inducing the phosphorylation and deactivation of the downstream signaling with AKT and ERK, and then stimulating uh, all the function mediated by IGF-1 receptor like gold. But when the single chain bind on the IGF-1 receptor, it's uh, avoiding the, the binding of IGF-1 to the receptors. And because the legs are too far from each other, the tyrosine kinase domain are phosphorylated, and thus the downstream signaling is not activated. And uh, the growth that was induced by IGF-1 is now inhibited. So the, 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 the different conclusion we did from, from this study is the fact that first, uh, the single chain LCD1 VIP antagonism is uh, restricted to the IGF-1 receptor. We don't see any antagonist uh, action on the insulin receptor. Uh, both single chain and double chain are weak agonists uh, for the insulin receptor. So suggesting that the glucose metabolism will not be uh, uh, affected. And uh, I didn't show that here, but it's, it's in the paper. Uh, the mice that express the LCDD1, uh, on these mice, we didn't see any change of blood glucose. Uh, we also, and it was, one of the big surprises of the of, of this study, uh, which we show that uh, two single chain LCD1 can bind together on the IGF and receptor, uh, that which induced the change of conformation that explained the, the uh, antagonist uh, potency of the single chain LCD1. And uh, in our knowledge, uh, the single chain LCD1 is the first uh, natural peptide that exhibits a, a specific antagonist potency on, on the IGF and receptor, which obviously could, could be quite interesting in drug development, especially for uh, cancer. Yes. Um, and, you know, I mean, you really drill down here on mechanism, you know, that's what it comes down to. And it's really a series of elegant experiments kind of spelling it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Very, very strange, I mean, yeah. cancer, yes. Uh, diabetes though, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's our focus. And, and, and really, I mean, there's an opportunity here. There is, yeah, there is clearly something interesting uh, about this all this barinsulin like peptide, and I, I really hope like that in like few years uh, we can see some people working on this barinsulin like peptide and try to like modify them to see yeah. if they can uh, affect uh, some function mediated by by the IGF and receptor or the, the insulin receptor. And I, I think it's quite interesting because here I show you uh, four barinsulin. I mean, we 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 they, they discovered four barinsulin, and uh, since we discovered two more barinsulin like peptide. And uh, we use uh, we use that public database, and we know that uh, there is only about ten thousand virus that were sequenced mm -hmm. uh, among all of the the virus that affect mammals. So yes. we estimate that we could uh, identify about two hundred uh, viral insulin like peptide. So mm -hmm. obviously, it would be very interesting to identify them, try to characterize how they interact with the insulin or the IGF one receptor or even other receptors. Uh, and it could be a, a really good way to uh, obviously better understand diabetes and how uh, diabetes works, but also to, to develop drugs uh, against uh, cancer or other, other uh, disease mediated by, uh, by the IGF. Yeah, if, absolutely. If I, Let's uh, open up to questions. Yes. Can I ask? Yeah. No, actually comment. Can yes. You, yeah. So I really liked uh, your work, uh, how, you know, the, this first uh, experimental data are... Um, uh, in vitro are then applied in vivo and uh, your trade of thought, uh, you know, so all credit to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So just the one thing uh, which you, you talk about cancer, diabetes, drug development, but here IGF is number one candidate target in aging and yeah. age related uh, biological mm -hmm. events, which uh, in terms of, you know, although I have all the certain reservations how today senescence is treated but also for example age-related diseases in terms of the senescent response of the cells and those bulk of cells contributing to disease onset and progression so i think i see just a huge potential from your work and uh, yeah it, it it will need differently uh, designed experiments but definitely i think aging and senescence will qualify for this type of discovery. So it was really nice. 
to hear Thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I totally agree. The aging is quite trendy right now. And I, I mentioned cancer because for me, it was the most obvious and I wanted to, to do something a little bit more with this study. I, I try a little bit to work into with cancer cells. And I was planning to do xenograph experiment that I didn't do uh, because it, it will take too much time. I really wanted to publish before, but okay. but yes, obviously, uh, aging is also in our mind, and and uh, there the, the may be uh, some interesting thing to do with uh, with aging, and also uh, so there is aging, but there is also some uh, normal disease uh, linked yeah. to stroke. For example, if you if you uh, inject IGF one in brain just after a stroke, uh, the, the 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 brain will be a little better. So you can you can also imagine that uh, bowel insulin like peptides mm -hmm. could be yeah. interesting for, for that too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's fascinating. So you're a postdoc now, um, Francois. Um, this looks like a big book of business to take. <laughs> to the next level uh to your to to a position um you know as a faculty somewhere um and really uh really interesting uh work uh, i know that city of hope right now they have a big cancer um you know uh, approach as well as a diabetes approach and they have new leadership there with alberto pulesi um peter thompson is uh really diving into senescence up in canada uh, Manitoba and also uh, Anil Bouchon at UCSF, very interested, both of them in senescence and um, how beta cells may become senescent and then contribute to the development of type 1 diabetes. So there's a lot of others out there that, you know, in the collaborative space. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best. Uh, this is really, really beautiful work, Francois. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. I just I just wanted I, I didn't mention yeah. that I just yeah. wanted to thanks all the people involved in this book obviously uh, <laughs> Ronald Khan my mentor which is uh, just here in the pictures and uh, all the people in the lab that were involved in this work and all our collaborators so at Emerald Tandis obviously that that uh, initiated this work uh, the people from Barcelona that made the AV uh, the people from Indiana that um, produced the the uh, Barcelona peptide. Uh, the people from Ohio that did the uh, mice, uh, the very good mice work, and the uh, group uh, Microdrons and Nicolas Kirk that did the cryo EM, which uh, was really the one of the nicest part of the of the paper. Fantastic. Well, congratulations to you all, and um, as we always sort of tout, it really uh, is going to take some collaborative science to crack the codes of these heterogeneous diseases. And uh, thanks so much for your part in it. Thank Can't you. Can't wait to see what you do next. Have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you, you too.